Welcome to the Pot.Live podcast. I'm your host, Lenny G. This podcast is all about connecting the community with the thought leaders of business and entertainment in the cannabis industry. As this industry expands and becomes more and more mainstream, we want to educate and entertain our listeners and become your choice and voice for all things cannabis. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. If you are into the recreational side of the cannabis industry, yes, stoners, I'm talking to you, then thepot.com is the online and mobile destination for you. That's right, T-H-E-P-O-T.com, thepot.com. Where else can you find the exclusive pot made of the month? Take a pot quiz and win prizes. Scroll through hilarious memes and jokes and check out the latest podcasts, news, and trends all while having your own profile and voice in the pot.com forum. Visit thepot.com today and get lit. Welcome to another episode of the pot.live podcast. I'm your host, Lenny G, and today I am honored to have Bruce Perlowin, the CEO of Hemp Inc. Hemp Inc. is a publicly traded company and is now their latest venture, and Bruce is going to tell us all about it, but they are now processing industrial hemp to manufacture hemp-derived bioplastics at its North Carolina facility. So, Bruce, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you, Lan. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, great. So why don't you give the listeners, you know, for people that don't know Hemp Inc. and don't know your name, why don't you tell us who you are and what Hemp Inc. does, and then we'll dive into some specifics. Okay, real quick background. Back in my 20s, when I was younger, I was the largest marijuana smuggler in West Coast history, and the media dubbed me the king of pot. I, I got to go to, I, I don't know if you knew that part. I did not. Anyway, That's fantastic. Yeah, the next year the movie will be out called Adventures of the King of Pot and the 10-part TV series. And I got to spend nine years in federal prison for being the king of pot. But I've been out of prison for 20 years already. Wow. And when I got out, I did a bunch of different companies, phone cards, international callback, barter companies. And then I started the first publicly traded company in what is now known as the pot stocks called Medical Marijuana Inc. I, uh, we sold that company about 12 years ago, and I saw I started Hemp Inc. because I saw hemp as the future. Back then, we didn't know about CBDs. I just used to say, you know something, hemp plastics, just one division of the 25,000 things you can make with hemp, is bigger than medical marijuana and recreational marijuana put together. So I focused back then on, uh, on industrial products that you can make with hemp. We then built the largest processing center, industrial hemp processing center in the, in the Western Hemisphere. And the thing that's got me the most excited is this bi- hemp bioplastics. We're circling back around to where some guy says, you don't, nobody's growing industrial hemp in America. It's all the stuff that we associate with industrial hemp. They're all growing CBDs. So uh, a guy comes to us and says, your plant grinds up your canaf and your hemp. Can you grind up hemp herd if we bring it in from Europe to the specifications that we need to make bioplastics? And I said, absolutely we can. So we did a trial run with 1,000 pounds. All right, we ground it up. We sent it off. They made the bioplastics. It worked perfectly. And now we're going to be doing 100,000 pounds every single month and of just pure hemp. And now keep in mind, this hemp is coming from Europe. We grind it because we have this big giant grinder. And we send it off to another company to make the pellets to make bioplastics, hemp bioplastics. Now, that is the coolest thing for me personally as, you know, growing up as an environmentalist and being in the eco commandos, as we called it in high school. And we did all kinds of environmental stuff to bring awareness to the catastrophe mankind is bringing in a million different areas of the environment. But to be able to be part of the supply chain to make bioplastics, I actually consider myself one of my heroes now (laughs) because I actually am doing something on a large scale that's going to change the world and bring hemp plastics into the environment. It's like the four minute mile. We know once we do it, just like I did the first publicly traded company down, there's 350 of them. Once we do that first bioplastics thing, which we've already tested and now we're in full production doing it, then everybody else will start doing it and we'll change the world of plastics and God knows we need to do that because we get a plastic made of hemp that is biodegradable. Yeah, and that's such a hot button topic now, obviously, with all the, uh, you know, 
plastic in the waters that they're finding and everything, these trash islands as they're, I guess they're termed. So that's a great venture for sure that you guys are doing. So let's, let's get some more information on Hemp Inc. So our listeners understand what are the other services? What are the other items that you provide at the North Carolina facility? I know you described some of it earlier, but the audio went in out in and out and I want to make sure that it's clear for our listeners. Okay. Uh, the first product we made is a, a canaf. Canaf is a plant that uh, looks like hemp. It's a very good fiber, but it's very absorbable. So we do a canaf, we grind that plant up with the hemp. So it's a canaf hemp blend. And we use it for what's called a LCM, lost circulation material. What that means is whenever you drill a well, anytime you drill an oil well, anywhere in the world, you have a drill bit, diamond tip drill bit, you have a lubricant to keep that bit from burning up. And when you drill through cracks and fissures, the lubricant will leak out and so you have to put in a lost circulation material, which plugs those cracks and fissures. Right now, they currently use these chemical concoctions to plug those as lost circulation material. And if those cracks and fissures lead to an aquifer underground, you're poisoning the aquifers, you know, five miles deep, two miles deep, one mile deep, however deep the well is. So we have the only natural alternative to the chemical concoctions in the world other than one small plant in Indonesia, which uses ground up bamboo as a lost circulation material. So that's hemp product number one, industrial hemp product. Hemp industrial product number two is an oil spill cleanup. Canaf is one of the, if not the most absorbable plants in the world. So we grind the whole plant up, mostly the herd, the inside of the plant, and we use it on oil spills. Uh, and that horizon oil spill in the Gulf years ago, uh, we tested out there. It worked uh, amazing. It worked a lot better than what they re- did. They dropped chemicals on it and made the oil go to the bottom of the ocean just so you don't see it. It's still there. This actually has an enzyme in it, the canal plant does, that actually eats oil. It actually uh, eats the oil. So in 24 hours, it'll eat about 25% of the oil, and then it absorbs the rest of it very, very effectively. So that's product number two. We have uh, part of the supply chain for creating hemp bioplastics. That's the three products we do. We also last year or two years ago, we we did um we grew CBD plants. We do have a farm there. We do grow CBDs and we do produce CBD oil. And uh, that was two years ago. And now this year we're focusing on growing uh, the, the grows in North Carolina. Focusing on one industrial hemp for you know to feed this new bioplastics pipeline. So we don't have to import it in from Europe. We can grow it in America. So we've got 50 acres growing right next door to our plant of industrial hemp. And then in the greenhouses and the fields far enough away from that, that it doesn't get cross pollinated. We're growing a lot of CBD to make CBD, not so much the oils this year, but hemp smokables in a line called the king of hemp. And so that's, you know, because people are starting to smoke hemp because it gets delivered into your bloodstream in 15 seconds, as opposed to a tincture, which to go to the digestive tract takes 45 minutes. And I'm doing a funny thing. I'm going to put all the old smugglers on the front cover of all my King of Hemp products. You know, the head of the Black Tuna Gang, uh, <laughs> the, you know, the guy from the movie, um, Billy Hayes from the movie Midnight Express. So you can look for the Midnight Express, Hemp Smokables, and the King of Pot Line, Black Tuna Gang, the Daring and Dashing Smith Brothers. I grew up in that era. I was a smuggler as a kid, and I know all the old guys, and I want them all to get royalties. So, you know, and, but then what I didn't realize, those guys are, are, are marketing maniacs. They didn't just smuggle. They, we sold millions of pounds of pot in the old days, and, and so one guy's got 18,000 stores ready to go. Another guy got 500 stores ready to go. So after the harvest this year, we'll be doing – the plan is to do up to a million pre-rolls a day. Currently, the machine, and we'll be doing this out of Las Vegas, out of our factory there, uh, we can do 20,000 a day. The next machine will do 20,000 an hour, and the final machine that we'll put in there will do a million pre-rolls a day. And I looked at the, you know, one of my consultants. I said, a million pre-rolls a day? I go, when are you going to buy the second machine? <laughs> because it's not hard. To... Yeah, I mean, that's one of the good things I am. I'm a good marketing guy, and a million pre-rolls a day, I – jokingly say will take me 10 to 15 minutes to sell, but it's not much longer than that in reality. Yeah, that's an interesting and unique story for sure. So, all right, so educate me. So let me back up. How did you get the King of Pot name? And obviously, I guess you got in trouble for smuggling, as you mentioned earlier. So 
tell us what you can about that journey and, and how that happened. Well, I can tell you everything, which, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. I find, okay. I find it interesting, and I'm not familiar with your story, and I, I bet you there's plenty of listeners that would love to hear it. All right. Well, I grew up in Miami, in North Miami, and during the 60s, in the hippie era, and marijuana became the drug of choice for my generation. And so I'm an, I was an entrepreneur. I was selling things since I was seven years old. And then naturally, when marijuana came along, we started, I started selling nickel bags and dime bags and ounces and pounds. And I started offloading. Then I became a smuggler myself with planes and boats because Florida was the importation zone for all of Columbia. So we literally moved millions and millions of pounds of marijuana through Florida uh, into the rest of the country. So then the cocaine cowboys came along and I was a nonviolent hippie smuggler. And I didn't like the guns and the cocaine and the, the, you know, the violence. So I moved my entire organization to Northern California, where it was still mellow and peaceful. And I pioneered a new smuggling route from the West Coast of Columbia to the West Coast of the United States and brought my boats underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. There was a documentary on CNBC called Marijuana Inc. Inside America's Pot Industry. They had a 10-minute segment with me in it. And they were covering the Emerald Triangle, but they wanted to cover the smuggler from the area back in the day. And the day it aired, 23 million people watched it and it became the number one most watched documentary in CNBC history. And it's aired about 200, 300 times. So most people in the industry recognized me from that documentary, um, you know, because I was showing them where I brought my boats in. And then I got arrested, you know, as most of us did in the old days. I spent nine years in federal prison. And what year it wasn't was this, too Chris? Bad. Probably somewhere in the uh, around 82, 80, around 80. And from basically from, let's see, 51, 61, 71, no, about 81, around 81. I basically spent from 30, from age 30 to 40 in prison. But it wasn't so bad. I was in the last two co ed prisons in America. I literally walked around holding hands with a female girlfriend, who, by the way, was the most watched 60 Minutes in the history of 60 Minutes. And that <laughs> night, the women would go to their units, and the men would go to their units. My girlfriend at the time was a Russian spy. She was a large espionage case of the 80s, made the best of 60 Minutes for a decade of the 80s. Mike Walls remembers 25 years of 60 Minutes and 35 years of 60 Minutes, because she really was a Russian spy convicted of espionage. <laughs> that was my girlfriend. <laughs> That's prison. incredible. Have you written a book? Now, you, you mentioned a TV show. Are they, what's the TV show about? Your, your life? Yeah, the, the plan is if you go to the king of pot, the movie.com, you'll see the trailer on the movie. But before they make the movie, they want to do a 10 part TV series on the Avengers of the King of Pot because that's the new thing now with the, what they call the binge watching. You, know, you watch the whole series. Yes. So the plan is that they want to do a 10 part TV series, give a three or four month cooling off period, and then launch with the full version of the movie. So, and, but that's just my slugging career. That's not, the, that has nothing to do with. You know, my best friends, I say, I joke around, I say my best friends are spies, assassins, jewelties, bank robbers, smugglers, bank robbers, and that's just the females. <laughs> so while I was in prison, I got five college degrees, made straight A's, made the national dean's list, the president's list. I mean, it was for me an unprecedented opportunity of a lifetime to learn, grow, and study. And, you know, the most dangerous thing that ever happened in prison for me was when I was squeezing Candace, the cute bank robber's rear end, and the Russian spy came around the corner and caught me. <laughs> <laughs> we, we need to see that reenacted in your show, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I mean, and, and, and the most dreadful thing that happened in prison, and this is cruel and unusual punishment, is when Candace, the cute bank robber, said no, she didn't want to go on a date to the movies with me every, on Saturday. Because every Saturday, we literally went and watched movies with our girlfriends. Wow. So it wasn't so bad. Unfortunately, <laughs> I don't recommend it now because there is no co-ed prisons. Right. Yeah, exactly. Different world. Different world. All right. So let's talk about the industry. That, that's all mesmerizing. But let's talk about the industry and what your views are on the entire cannabis industry. You know, you can funnel this answer towards hemp if you want. But just the entire cannabis industry. You see all these different brands coming out. Who knows what's real? Who knows what's not? You see all the, the institutional money sitting on the sidelines waiting for legalization. What do you foresee in the next few years, in your opinion, based on your experience of where this is going as far as mainstream legalization and who's going to take over these markets? Okay. First of all, I'd like to say we've won the war and now we're just negotiating the terms of the surrender. 
All right, we won the war uh, on the cannabis. It's all going to be legal. Uh, I, I mean, 47 states are legal with hemp, and everybody's behind it. Billionaires are a dime a dozen. They all want to jump in. The interesting thing is that after the 2018 Farm Bill passed and all of a sudden hemp became legal, now instead of having a billionaires a dime a dozen, there's like a thousand billionaires and a thousand hedge funds. They all want in the industry, mostly hemp. And an interesting thing has also happened. Smokable hemp came out of nowhere. I mean, don't take my word for it. Go Google it. It's selling for three to nine hundred dollars a pound. In Oregon, marijuana crashed and burned. Last, two years ago, it was 250 to 300 a pound. Most of the farmers have switched over from cannabis to hemp. Now, I believe in both. I'm much more passionate about hemp than I am about marijuana, because marijuana, for me, is sort of an old story. But we have won the war. It is going to be legal. The biggest hurdle right now is how, especially with smokable hemp, is how we're going to get around the over billion dollars in tobacco taxes that the state of California makes in each state you look in the list i saw a list recently they make a lot of money in tobacco and people are quitting tobacco and going to hemp and also my generation 55 and older they're all going back to smoking cannabis you know because what happened is we stopped a lot of us stopped in the 60s because we became teachers and became truck drivers and we didn't want to lose our jobs right i mean i can see this in my own circle i'm 68 and everybody i know who quit smoking marijuana has started again because they're retired. And I just read an article, the largest, fastest group of cannabis users is now 55 and older because that's when you need it. That's when you start hurting and that's when you have aches and pains and you can't sleep and you have this condition, and that condition. So, you know, when you get that, that many people that age starting to smoke cannabis, you're not fighting the hippies and, and one generation. You're fighting the whole population. It's not the hippies versus the establishment anymore. It's the bankers are in it. I mean, the first recreational dispensary in Las Vegas that opened up was opened up by the mayor of Las <laughs> Vegas. Right, so you have too many politicians. You have too many big people, too many hedge funds, too much money to be made to fight it. Right? We literally out finance the federal government at this point. They go against someone and the activists just don't stop. And we're not going to stop until we get total 100% legalization. You can walk down the street and smoke hemp or smoke medical marijuana or recreational marijuana, just like you smoke cigarettes today, except it's healthier by a long shot than cigarettes. So we all know the numbers. Cigarettes and alcohol kill a half a million people a year. Marijuana kills zero and it's healthy for you. How do they get around the fact that the taxes are so inhibitive to people that they're still going to the black market because they can get it so much cheaper? See, that's a great point. That's what the government doesn't get. They don't get, if they don't lower their taxes, the black market's still going to be there. And enforcement's down, so no one's enforcing it anymore. It's like no big deal. I mean, it's amazing the, 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 the way it switched the perception of somebody smoking marijuana. Yeah, there's still a little bit of stigma there. But that stigma has gone way, 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 way down. That, that's a big problem. And I don't know the answer to that, except you've got to lower the taxes if you expect people to, you know, what kind of taxes are there on tomatoes and celery and, and onions? There's not very many. And you're either going to lower the taxes to become realistic or the black market's going to proliferate and nobody's going to stop the black market. So I foresee that. There'll be massive use, way more than they anticipate and think. And if they lower the taxes to one tenth of where they are now, then people won't mind paying the taxes and the black market will tend to go away. Yeah, I just read an article this morning, actually, uh, and it said three out of four frequent smokers in California are still going to the black market due to the cost and all the newbies are afraid to go to the black market because they're not familiar with the process, I guess, and they're going to the legit places and paying up for it. So it'll be interesting to see if the newbies into the, you know, using the product uh, drive the train or if the old frequent smoker drives the train, you know, as far as cost and taxes, it'll be interesting. That will be interesting and it will be a migration. It'll be a migration. Newbies will go to the places where they pay the taxes until they find out, wait a minute, my brother can get it or my uncle, my cousin, my son can get it for, for half the price and not pay the taxes. So there'll be a migration from the newbies going to pay the taxes to where they go to the black market because the black market's not getting arrested and put in jail for life anymore or right. for five years when it's 
you know, or, or long-term prison sentences, that's going away. So the risk of buying in the black market is dropping. Therefore, the only solution is lower those taxes, guys, or you're going to lose the marketplace and lose the tax money. True. Okay, so before we finish up, Bruce, with a couple of questions, how can everyone learn more about Hemp Inc.? I know it's hempinc.com is the website. Is that the best place for people to learn more about the company? Correct, yeah. If you go to hempinc.com, now, we're, by the way, we're redoing that website, so there'll be more and more stuff on it because we do a thing called the Hemp University. We just finished the ninth Hemp University, and we want live interactive video on that website. And also, the other footprint I'm doing, I build eco-villages, and the first one I'm building is out in Arizona called the Veteran Village Kins Community, and that's where we grow our hemp. I grow my hemp on an eco-village that rehabs veterans. So you can make your money, teach them a new life, teach them how to grow hemp, teach them how to build a, what's called a kin's domain, which is just a two and a half acre homestead, you know, with a pond and an organic garden and a beehive and, 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 you know, a life moving back to the land kind of lifestyle. But you can afford it because while you're going through rehab, you know, from whatever post-traumatic stress disorder, you're making $60,000 a year growing hemp because we show you how to do that and give you a living. So I'm still the hippie from the 60s that wants to change the world. But the, my rule is, since I work in the economic realm of changing the world, is you want to change the world, you better make a lot of people a lot of money or it's not going to happen. So that's another place. So you can go to the hempuniversity.com. You can get to everything we're doing. It's from hempinc.com. And then there'll be links to all the other places. In fact, you can go there and you can put locations, push button locations, get Arizona, and you'll see the first of 64 live streaming video cameras of the Kins community. That's my other passionate thing because that's changing the world. It's, it's Right now it's a desert and we're doing a hempathon, which we have, we only got four contestants because it's the middle of the desert and everyone wants to grow in their own places to grow, to see who's the best grower out in a desert condition. And that'll be live streaming video cameras. 64 will be up. You can see one up right now. And, and it's pretty cool. You know, there's seven geodesic domes up there and that's the holistic healing and learning center. And it's rehabbing veterans. That's, that's this year. Next year will be one for abused women and children. Next one will be for homeless. Next one will be for orphans. So each one of these back to the land eco villages that grow hemp also support a social cause and help solve a social problem. Yeah, that's great. And you're doing a lot of really interesting things to help the world, like you said. So that's pretty cool. Congrats to you on that. So our final question, Bruce. We, our listeners are varied between people just trying to learn about the industry and be educated. They're new to it. Then there's also the startup business owner and there's the professional in the industry as well that listens to our show. So can you give us some tidbits on the value of going public with a company versus staying private based on your experience for people that are in that position right now? The only reason you go public is to raise money. If you have a good revenue source and more and more of them are showing up out of the woodwork, right? Because it's legal now, so it's in the, hemp, in the hemp world. You don't really need to go public. Going public allows you to raise millions and millions of dollars to build the necessary infrastructure. So if you, I mean, I'm sort of proud of that too, because I started the first publicly traded company in the sector, like I said, and now uh, there's oh, uh, somewhere around three, 350. And that's an economic force to be reckoned with. You know, you're talking about, I mean, I think we have close to a million shareholders, I mean, I'm a uh, hemp thinker is like well, close to 12 years old already. And uh, so do you go public? Do you not go public? I, I would say if you need money and you don't have millions of dollars from some other source, going public is a great strategy. And for people that want to invest in public companies, you know, it's, it's a roller coaster. I right? don't invest in a public company any more money than you can afford to lose. You know, we've had our ups. We, everyone loves us when we're going up, like right now, the last few days. Everyone hates us when we're going down and they get mad at us, you know. But uh, I spent 10 years building an infrastructure and I'll spend the next years generating revenue from that infrastructure and it's not little revenue. When you start growing a million pounds on one field and, and, uh, and that's not including all of our fields that we're growing. So we expect massive revenues and we'll go through the roof. You know, I mean, uh, I, I, I can say that because I'm confident we will. And so the little people can just invest. Not the little people. Little people, mean people, and big people can invest in public companies. A good one, Veritas Farms. They're the darling of the industry. I have to give them a plug. Hemp Inc. and Veritas Farms. Hemp Inc. were, you know, 
don't expect to see any giant moves until um, until after the harvest. Then expect to see giant moves because we'll have giant revenue. But Veritas Farms, they're the they're the darling of the industry as far as I'm concerned. They're the ones that are in CVS Pharmacy. They're the ones that are in all the big stores. I don't want to name all the big stores because I think they're not supposed to mention them all. Bed Bath and Beyond, you know, they're <laughs> they're on. Aw- they're, they're awesome. They're awesome. They knock it out of the park. They do everything perfectly. They grow their own hemp organically. They process it the right way. They got plenty of supply side, so they're not going to run out. And they're just a great company with a good, stable product. I mean, we've tested their product. It's, what they say is in the label is in the product. We, we know. We tested it with Digipath Labs out of Las Vegas, who happens to be another publicly traded company, which is another awesome company, happens to be my cousin. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> nice. Nice. Well, Bruce, that's awesome. I mean, you gave us a lot of value. You gave everybody a lot of tidbits and definitely some interesting stories we haven't heard before. So we wish you the best of luck. We'll put all your company information in the show notes so everybody can go check out hempinc.com and the other websites you mentioned and your upcoming show. Bruce Perlowin, thank you so much for your time, my friend. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. And we'll see you next time on the Pot.Live podcast. If you are into the recreational side of the cannabis industry, yes, stoners, I'm talking to you, then thepot.com is the online and mobile destination for you. That's right, T-H-E-P-O-T.com, thepot.com. Where else can you find the exclusive pot made of the month? Take a pot quiz and win prizes. Scroll through hilarious memes and jokes and check out the latest podcasts, news, and trends, all while having your own profile and voice in the pot.com forum. Visit thepot.com today and get lit.